What's cracking YouTube? Welcome back to the channel. As always, it's your boy Nick. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. Tell you what, it's weird not getting videos out like four or five times a week. So it feels good to be getting back in front of the camera and talking to you guys about some fantasy stuff. This is gonna be a long one and this is what I'm gonna be doing every week. So bear with me. This is just a recap basically of week one. Things to expect going forward. We're gonna be talking about key injuries from week one, what they mean. Notable wide receiver versus cornerback matchups. We're gonna look at some of the murky running back situations in the NFL, some must starts for this week, sell high candidates, people just to relax, to sit on, buy low candidates, some guys that you can cut, get them off your roster, streaming defenses of the week, always my locks of the century, you know, for you gambling folks, my league recaps, and at the end of the video, I'm gonna be doing a giveaway. Two of my big dogs gotta eat hats are going to two y'all. I'm gonna put my head on, I'll be right back. So stay tuned towards the end to figure out how you can be one of the two giveaways. I'm giving away one baby blue, one pink. Also, every Tuesday I'm putting out a waiver wire sheet. So my top waiver wire ads Tuesday because everyone's process is on Wednesday. So make sure that you are subscribed to my blog. What I want you to do is head over, I'll link it right here. We're here, I forget where it pops up. BDGEAT.com. On the homepage, you'll scroll down and you'll see somewhere you can put your name and your email in. And on that, that's like my, my newsletter list. I'll email you out every Tuesday when the new waiver wire sheet drops. So make sure you're subscribed there. Also, yo, I had so much fun live streaming on YouTube on Sunday morning. So I got on at about like 11 or 10.45, I don't know. A lot of you guys came through at one point or another. I think for the most part, there was like somewhere from like 50 to 60 on at one time. But overall, I think it said there was like 400 or 500 that, that came in and out throughout like the two hours, just talking, bullshitting, answering sit start questions, things like that. It was a lot of fun. So I'm definitely gonna be doing that every Sunday morning, probably around 11 a.m. until kickoff. So make sure that you're getting notifications from my channel. You go to one of my videos, you'll see that little bell right there. You just click notifications. So when I go live, it'll give you a notification either to your phone or your desktop that I'm on live and you could just join in there. You guys can ask me any questions that you want at that time. Also, make sure you're following me on Twitter because I post it on there too. So without further ado, Let's talk week one and week two. That was a good rhyme. Okay, first thing I wanna say is everyone relax. Week one is one week, one week of 14 weeks. It's a tiny percentage of, you, of your fantasy football run to the championship of bringing home the gold, of bringing home the, the ring, the trophy, the belt, whatever y'all do in your leagues. So just, just simmer down before we get rattled and we start making ignorant trade moves. 80% of the key players this week, shit the bed. Yo, most people's teams absolutely stunk this week. If you weren't stacking the Chiefs offensive lineup, Tyreek Hill, Kareem Hunt, Alex Smith, if you weren't in on those three players, your team probably sucked this week. Here's a few stats I wanna throw out from week one. If you exclude quarterbacks, four of the top 10 scoring fantasy players this week were defenses. Four of the top 10. That's half point PPR. If it was standard, I'm sure it even be, it might be five out of 10. Defenses played a huge role in winning your week one matchup because a lot of key players were just awful. In week one of 2016, last year, quarterbacks threw 48 touchdowns. In week one, 2017 this year, quarterbacks threw 38 touchdowns. In week one of 2016, last year, running backs scored 25 rushing touchdowns. This year, week one, 15. So there was just an overall drop off in scoring, passing touchdowns, rushing touchdowns. It was just a shitty week overall. Get past it. The other thing I wanna say is I'm getting a lot of questions about the waiver wire and stuff. If you didn't read my article, obviously it's probably a little late now, but you could still grab some of the guys on the wire. Wednesday morning, not only do you gotta check who you landed, right? Like you're putting in your fab bids, you're, you know, you're processing your waiver claims. Always, 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 always look who your league mates dropped as well, because that could be just as good as what the waiver wire was before it processed. Here are a couple guys that were on my waiver wire that dropped. In my four money leagues, these are a couple examples of guys that were available for this next week. Eric Ebron was dropped in a 14-teamer. Rashard Matthews, Eric Decker, Frank Gore, Arizona defense who struggled last week, but they get Indianapolis without Andrew Luck in week two. And that's just from my four money leagues. They're they're pretty sharp for the most part, and, and they're deep as well, so you're not gonna see as many big name leagues, but there, I have someone on Twitter asked me today, said Chris, uh, Christian McCaffrey was dropped, should I grab him? Like, the, you always, 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 this is just a reminder, always check 
who your league mates dropped as well as who you got. Anyways, let's power forward, homies and homets, until the good stuff. Key injury number one, obviously David Johnson, running back Arizona, messed up his wrist, gonna be out for a while. Head coach Bruce Arian said he's hopeful either Thanksgiving or Christmas. Regardless, it's gonna be like a two to three month stretch, possibly longer without David Johnson. What do you do here? Well, after Johnson left the game, Kerwin Williams, their backup, came in, rushed the ball five times, 10 yards, did score a touchdown, but he was actually out-snapped by Andre Ellington, 20 to nine. Cardinals went out, re-signed Chris Johnson, CJ2K, and we know how Bruce Arians loves his veterans. Now, I see this in two different ways. You could look at it in one of two ways, right? You could say, yeah, they re-signed Chris Johnson, but there's no way he's going to get a big role considering that he was already cut once in favor of the guys that are on the roster right now, Kerwin Williams and Andre Allen. So why would they bring him back to get more playtime? You could also look at it and saying that, you know, Bruce Arians loves veterans. He loves that Chris Johnson already knows the playbook. And maybe in making that decision to cut Chris Johnson, he just saw Kerwin Williams and Andre Ellington as better compliments to David Johnson. Maybe neither of them have that workhorse, you know, mentality or that workhorse trait to them. And they already had that in Johnson, so they didn't need David Johnson, so they didn't need that in Chris Johnson. And now that they get Chris Johnson back, maybe he could be, you know, the early down grinder and more of a workhorse per se. This is gonna be a full-blown running back by committee, no matter which way you look at it. Kerwin Williams, Chris Johnson, both gonna get early down work. Who knows who's gonna get the goal line work? Kerwin Williams did score a goal line touchdown in, in week one, but Andre Ellington is definitely my favorite PPR play in this backfield. I would say Kerwin Williams has already named the starter for week two. Doesn't necessarily mean he's gonna get the bulk of the work, but I actually think he's a nice plug-in RB2 kind of flex play for week two because they do get the Indianapolis Colts. Uh, they're a seven point favorite according to Vegas. So, you know, Vegas expects them to be winning. I'm sure there will be goal line opportunities to be had against this Colts defense. But outside of week two, this is, is really shitty and I would not be spending any kind of waiver or uh, big budgets on either of these three guys. Like I said, Ellington is definitely my favorite in PPR formats for the other two. I don't know, take a stab, but don't waste big money on it. Number two, we had Allen Robinson, lost for the year, torn ACL. That's just absolutely fantastic considering I had him in I think two different teams. So that leaves Alan Hearns and Marquise Lee as basically their only weapons. They're wide receiver one, wide receiver two. Lee is is like the fantasy darling right now. He's like the favorite among the fantasy community. Last year he came on really strong, caught 63 balls, 851 yards. He only caught three touchdowns, but that's kind of the nuance of coming with the Jacksonville Jaguars offense. Now Hearns has a much bigger resume. His rookie year, he had about 600, 700 yards, six touchdowns. His sophomore year, a thousand yards, 10 touchdowns. Last year he fell off injuries other things just didn't really capitalize on his in his third season that being said you know I, I like both guys as a speculative ed Allen Robinson has averaged 150 targets over each of the last two seasons so it's a lot of targets up for grabs my preference here would definitely be Alan Hearns I know that's definitely in the minority and most people are trying to be cute and be like Marcus Marquise Lee whatever he's dealt with injuries his entire career he was much more highly touted as a prospect coming out of USC. He was a second rounder, but like I said, dealt with injuries, hasn't really had a lot of time to, to really make himself useful in the offense, but he did last year at the end of the year, and that's why people are very high on him. I would say, you know, Hearns is 6'3". He's a big dude. He's, he's put up good numbers before. You know, we had that good sophomore and freshman campaign, and uh, I think his touchdown upside is much higher here. They both played 77% of the snaps in Jacksonville's week one game. So they're gonna get almost identical playing time. They're gonna be the outside guys in two wide receiver sets. The interesting thing here I would say is when it's three wide receiver sets, it's, I guess it's gonna be like a really as Ben as their third wide receiver. Hearns is gonna move over to the slot which for me says more targets, it says more receptions, it says easier cornerback matchups there. Neither of them have a crazy high ceiling. There's not gonna be a ton of passing volume. They like to run the ball clearly from what we saw in week one. Their defense is very, 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 very much improved. So. The, the pace of the game is going to be very slow if things go according to plan for Jacksonville. I will say, though, there will be plenty of passing volume to go around eventually. This game script for week one could literally not have turned out better for Jacksonville and Leonard Fournette. It will not be the case every week going forward. They're going to be underdogs in a lot of the games. So don't expect neither of them to put up numbers. You know, I actually think Hearns is going to have a pretty nice season with, with Allen Robinson out of the picture. So he's my preferred play here. Not crazy high on either of them, though. D.D. Westbrook, who had the big pre, the rookie who had a real flashy preseason, looked really good, and he's not going to be coming back until like week nine, I don't think. So he's on the IR, and when he comes back, he's definitely a guy to keep monitoring because he'll have some opportunity when he does come back. But 
only deeper leagues for now. And we move to Danny Woodhead. Man, fuck Danny Woodhead. Two out of the first three guys I talked about, my injuries were my, in my starting lineup. Woodhead was on his way to a huge game. Caught three balls, 33 yards in about 14 seconds, then pulls up with his lame hamstring on a red zone target. We've heard he's gonna, he's expected to miss anywhere from like the initial reports four to six. Now it's like six to eight. Now they're deciding whether or not they want to put him on the IR, which would be for eight weeks. It puts you in no man's land as a fantasy owner. I would say if you're in, if you're in a league with an IR spot, definitely utilize that. I'm in, I have him in two leagues. One of my leagues, I have an IR spot. So I put Danny Woodhead there. My other league, we don't open up the IR spot until after week four games have been played because we do a keeper and people take like Jordy Nelson when he was injured, Julian Edelman this year. So if you want to be an asshole and take like one of those guys, so you can keep them for next year. You have to at least roster him for like four weeks. So in that league, I dropped Danny Woodhead. So if, unless you're in like a deeper league, I'm probably not keeping him. Or if you have an IR spot, then I would, I would suggest keeping him too. But looking forward, you know, we have Buck Allen, Javoris Allen, which he'll be listed as in Yahoo if you're looking for him, and Terrence West in this backfield. For me, Javoris Allen is definitely the favorite to lead this backfield in, you know, half point PPR, PPR leagues, uh, receptions for that. And you think about it all offseason when, when Wood had already dealt with this hamstring injury, right? When he's dealing with the issues throughout the offseason and training camp and whatnot. Who was it taking these snaps and these reps as the receiving back in this offense? It was Allen. It was Buck Allen. There were reports coming out saying that he looked good. So there's no doubt in my mind he's going to be the guy that plays this role in this offense now. And you saw how valuable it was from Woodhead in just like the first drive of the game. And you look at their their week one game, right? Their 20-0 win over Cincy. Javorius Allen had 21 carries. Terrence West had 19. They both played in 50% of the team's snaps. Now that volume, the 21 to 19 carries, 40 carries out of those two running backs is definitely not gonna be what happens on a week to week basis, right? That was like literally the perfect game script. And that's, that's you know, that's a tough one. This is a week one that it's kind of abnormal in the, in the sense that a lot of the big free agent pickups and a lot of the big waiver wire ads this week, tough to get a grasp on because of how the game flow went in a lot of games. Like the Jaguars, you don't know how much they're really going to be running the rock or passing the block, uh, the rock. Uh, Baltimore winning 20 nothing over Cincy, so both running backs look really good. The volume is not going to carry over. I do think both backs will probably get around 12 to 15 touches a game going forward, and they both give you RB3 flex value for at least like the next six weeks as Woodhead is gone. I like Allen as a play in PPR over Terrence West for sure. And I know like there's rumors, there's fucking reports about Michael Campanaro taking Woodhead's role, but this is what it said. So before you just read the headlines, when uh, Joe Flacco was asked about Woodhead's role, how are they going to combat his injury? He said, hopefully we have some guys that can step up and hit some plays. Mike Campanaro is one of those little quick little guys that can do stuff on the side. That's not saying, like, it wasn't like Dan he's going to be playing the Danny Woodhead running back role. He's literally just saying, that's like coach talk. You have to answer the question, right? He's just saying that someone has to step up in the offense. Campanaro just happens to fit that, like, quick slot role. He's never played running back in the NFL. He's a wide receiver, a slot receiver. He's not just going to be moving back into that running back position. He's not going to be getting 50% of the snaps from the running back position. That is Buck Allen's, you know, it kind of goes back to, like, Darren Sproles' role where people every year want to say, oh, you know, he's going to be the next Darren Sproles. He's doing Darren Sproles' role. Darren Sproles is a beast, though. That's It's not a role. He's just super talented, and that goes with Danny Woodhead as well. You can't just put Michael Campanero, who hasn't done shit in four years, into Danny Woodhead's spot and expect that production. Buck Allen has proven before that he can maintain a pass-catching role here, and I think Campanero, sure, he might get some targets now. There's a lot of there's going to be a lot of targets up for grabs in this offense. That doesn't mean that Campanero is suddenly going to get 10 rushes and 7 uh, seven targets out of the backfield. I just think don't look in too much into that when you read those headlines. Next up, we got Kevin White. Your boy fractured his collarbone again out for the season. Honestly, just prolong the inevitable of us seeing him be a terrible wide receiver in the NFL. So it's irrelevant. What this does for me, they literally have no weapons on the outside. They're the Marcus Wheaton is their wide receiver one. Kendall Wright, you can completely miss me with that. I don't want to hear the Glennon has to throw to someone on the outside, whatever. For me, it gives a boost to Tyree Cohen and it gives a boost to Zach Miller. They have no play Playmakers, and Terry Cohen is easily the best playmaker now from a pass catching role in this offense. 12 targets in his first game, ridiculous. And they're gonna be they're gonna have to utilize him. They might even put in a lot of packages where you see Howard and Cohen on the field at the same time because they're in desperate need of playmakers. So Kevin White out. The only stock that makes go up for me is Terry Cohen and Zach Miller. Lastly, I know this is gonna be a little ridiculous, but Sebastian Janikowski, placed on the IR from the Raiders. I would never have brought this up had I not picked him up in one league and then had to drop him. But their backup, Giorgio Tavecchio, 
however you say his name, 27 year old from University of California, looked really, really, really good in their week one win. He hit all four of his field goals, two of them 52 yarders, a 42 yarder, and a 20 yarder, two for two on his extra points. That's 19 fantasy points right there. You're talking about a kicker for the Oakland Raiders who is, you know, they're a team that's gonna be putting up 25 plus points a game. So when you're looking at kickers, you always just wanna throw in a kicker that kicks for a high scoring team. And I think this guy, Tavecchio, from what he looked like nailing the kicks is a perfect replacement for Jenikowski. All right, so the wide receiver quarterback matchup sheet is not up on Pro Football Focus yet. It's going up tomorrow morning. I'm filming this on Wednesday night. So I'm gonna film that. I'll jump into it tomorrow once it's done and I'll put it in right here. Welcome to Thursday. Did a little time traveling. Let's get into the wide receiver cornerback matchups. First on my list, Larry Fitzgerald versus Nate Harrison of the Indianapolis Colts. I know Palmer and Fitz did not look good last week. Fitz actually rated really high in Pro Football Focus which means a lot of the blame can probably be put on Carson Palmer. But I'll tell you who looked worse than Palmer and Fitz. The Indianapolis Colts defense who just got whopped by the Rams. Put the Rams game on. Fitz and Harrison ran the majority of their routes from the slot. Fitz ran 64% of his routes from the slot. Harrison ran 96% of his routes defending the slot. So they're gonna be going up against each other. Harrison just allowed four catches on six targets, 76 yards, and a touchdown to Cooper Cup in week one. So I can only imagine what the veteran, the 34-year-old Fitz is going to do to Harrison. Without David Johnson, Palmer, he has no choice but to rely on Fitzgerald and his passing game. So fire Fitz up with confidence at least for one more week. Second matchup, we got Marvin Jones versus Janoris Jenkins. Detroit coming to New York. Monday night football, I'm actually gonna be at that game. Gonna be tailgating, going to the game, should be a good ass time. But much like we saw with Janoris Jenkins on Des Bryant and Patrick Peterson on Marvin Jones in week one, gonna flip now, Jenkins is supposedly going to be shadowing Marvin Jones for week two. Now we saw behind Des Bryant, right? Terrence Williams had a pretty nice day in week one, uh, six catches, 68 yards. This defense overall is very stiff, right? The Giants is a pass defense, their rush, uh, their run defense is very good all around. But the Lions play a ton of three wide receiver sets. Their ground game struggled last week, and I'm expecting it to struggle again in week two. So with Kenny Galladay playing around like 64% of their snaps last week, and that only expecting to increase gradually, I would definitely sit Marvin Jones. I don't really love Golden Tate or Kenny Galladay, but either of them would be the preferred fantasy play over Jones is going to get shadowed by uh, Patrick Peterson. I mean, uh, Janoris Jenkins. And speaking of Patrick Peterson, he is a shadow cornerback. T.Y. Hilton is the Colts' number one wide receiver. Colts don't have Andrew Luck. Therefore, you have to sit T.Y. Hilton this week. Tyree Kill. First game in Arrowhead this year, going against the Philadelphia Eagles. Coming off this huge game, right? It's fair to wonder, is Hill still a one-hit wonder? I don't know why people would still wonder that. What's a one-hit wonder? Wonder, wonder, what's in a one-hit wonder ball? Um, can, he, can he sustain it? I think he will, at least for another week. They go against this Philly defense that just lost their best cornerback in Ronald Darby to a dislocated ankle. Behind him, they have Jalen Mills, who is supposed to cover Tyree Kill for most of the day. He's not a shadow cornerback, but the routes line up that they'll see a lot of each other. And Jalen Mills was Pro Football Focus's third worst cornerback, according to the ratings, in week one. Again, he's not a shadow, but neither Patrick Robinson or Malcolm Jenkins behind Mills is a good cornerback either. So I expect Tyree Kill to eat, eat again. Let's move over to Devontae Parker. We haven't seen any game action from him in 2017, right? But they go against the Chargers. And I don't think people really understand how good this cornerback duo is for the Chargers. Casey Hayward and Jason Verrett. Hayward rated as the fifth best cornerback in week one. It was only behind Chris Harris Jr., Dominique Rogers, cromartie Aqib Tlaib, Malcolm Butler, then Casey Hayward. Jason Verrett actually rated pretty poorly in week one, but Hayward is a shadow coverage guy, but that's what both of them do. They, they lock down the top two uh, wide receivers on the other team, and Hayward is supposedly going to be covering Devontae Parker, which is going to be a really tough matchup for him. They're going to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, and I'm not saying that Parker, you know, can't bust loose and, and break out and have one of those big 50-yard catches down the field, because I'm sure he's going to get a few of those targets, but I would temper expectations for this week. Moving along, we have Pierre Garçon, San Francisco, for Shaquille, is it Shaquille? Shaquille Griffin of Seattle. So Garcon ran 50% of his routes from the left side of the field, 
right? He's not the he's not the slot receiver in San Francisco. So the left side is his primary position. The Seahawks' top two corners, you have Richard Sherman and Jeremy Lane. Richard Sherman plays on the left side of the field, so he go he goes against the right wide receiver. Jeremy Lane locks down the slot. So that leaves Garcon to play to run most of his routes against Griffin. Griffin ranked in the bottom 10 of like 90 to 100 qualified cornerbacks according to Pro Football Focus in week one. So he is not doing well. Garcon, on the other hand, did really well. He was the number sixth ranked wide receiver by PFF in week one. It was behind guys like Antonio Brown, Julio Jones, AJ Green, Michael Thomas, and then Garcon. And he backed it up with, with a really nice day, right? Six for 10, 81 yards. They're going to Seattle. They're two touchdown underdogs. So they are going to be throwing it a ton. I would be shocked if Garcon didn't walk out of this game with another double digit target game. But I really like Garcon as like a sneaky play. Again, you know, a lot of people see the matchup, they see Seattle and they shy away, but I don't think that's what you should be doing in this matchup. Lastly, we're going to be talking about murky running back situations after this, but I want to talk about the Tennessee wide receivers. All three wide receivers receivers rated well according to PFF. Uh, Decker was the lowest rated receiver followed by Davis and Rashard Matthews led them with the highest rating per PFF. They all did well. They all saw at least eight targets. I mean Decker didn't produce well but they all rated well. And they all looked pretty good. Unfortunately they get a group of cornerbacks that also looked pretty good if not great in the Jacksonville Jaguars, right? They have Jalen Ramsey, A.J. Bowie, and Aaron Colvin. Neither of these guys are shadow cornerbacks but we're expecting Jalen Ramsey to cover Rashard Matthews for most of the day, Bowie on Davis, and Colvin on Decker. Now, Ramsey shut down DeAndre Hopkins last week, right? He was targeted six times while Ramsey was covering him, only let up three catches for 23 yards. What's weird is he he played in every single snap uh, during that game, and he didn't practice on Wednesday due to, I think it was an ankle injury or something. It could be very, very minor. I'm not really sure what the update is as of right now. There is no update yet, but something to keep an eye on. If Jalen Ramsey sits, then I would be okay playing Rashard Matthews. But if not, I, I would expect this passing game to struggle as a whole. Those are my top, you know, my most notable wide receiver cornerback matchups for the week. Also, if you're enjoying the video so far, please do me a favor and uh, give it that thumbs up, please. Just scroll down a little bit, hit the button that looks like that. Let's take a bike to Wednesday. Back to Wednesday night. Murky running back situations. Let's start with Seattle. You have Thomas Rawls listed as a starter. He's been recovering from a high ankle sprain, did not play in week one. Chris Carson, my boy, who I've been touting all offseason, led the backfield, 39 rushing yards on six carries. He added a 10 yard catch. He led the backfield in snaps, which this is the most important to me. He had 26 snaps, ProSize only had 16, Eddie Lacy, seven snaps. He easily looked like the best back on the field, the best running back for Seattle, he was making plays, he's making something out of nothing in a game where their offensive line was getting absolutely murdered. But Chris Carson found a way to, you know, average over six yards per carry. So fat boy Lacey, Eddie Lacey is just out of the picture. Procise is gonna eat into the snaps a little bit, but it's gonna be interesting to see what happens when Thomas Rawls comes back. Pete Carroll said that, you know, he will play in week two against San Francisco. It's a nice matchup, but I, I think Rawls and Carson, I think Rawls will get the start, but I think both of them, Rawls and Carson will split the early down work. I think it'll almost be a near share. Maybe Rawls gets 10 carries, Carson gets like eight to 10. So it's a slight favor of Rawls. But that being said, their offensive line was absolutely atrocious in week one versus Green Bay. Neither back is more than like an RB3 or a flex play for week two. We need more, we need to shed more light on this situation before we put any, either of these guys into our starting lineup. But if I had to bet right now, just, just based on how it looks and the way Pete Carroll's talking about him, Carson is gonna lead this backfield in touches by the end of the season. He can carry the ball, catch the ball, and and block. So I'm okay rostering Rolls and or Carson for the time being. I'm probably gonna be letting go of pro stuff. I don't own him anywhere, but for you guys, especially in uh, shallow leagues, like 10 teams, I'm definitely okay letting go of pro size. Switch gears to Cincinnati. Nothing surprising here in week one. All three backs, Mixon, Jeremy Hill, Geo got their snaps, got their touches. Geo saw the high of snaps, played on 44.4% of their snaps. Mixon played in 37, and Hill played in just, just under 17% of their snaps. That split is not surprising given that they were losing basically they lost 20 nothing, so they were trailing big time the entire game. You're not going to have a guy like Hill playing running back when you have Mixon and Geo as superior pass catchers. You're playing catch up. Mixon and Geo played around the same amount of snaps. I will say though, Mixon was, in, was involved, and when I say involved, he either had a rush or a target on 20.4% of his snaps, where Geo was under 15% and Hill was just at around 10%. So Mixon's more involved, right? He actually led the team in carries and overall touches with 11, but Geo, Geo broke away with like a big reception for like 40 yards. He outgained 
Mixon 79 to 24. So, you know, it wasn't a good showing by any part of the Cincinnati offense. It didn't help clear this backfield up at all for us. You know, chalk it up to a rough start, chalk it up to Baltimore's great defense, but it'd be smart to just completely stay away from this backfield for the time being. I mean, it's very possible one of them puts up like RB3 flex numbers this week, but it's only, it would be almost impossible to choose who, right? Mixon can go off. Hill might get that rut, that that goal line score. Geo might catch four or five pads. Like it's way too tricky to to choose one. So I would be benching any of them. Move over to New York. It's only a matter of time before the Jets hand this backfield, hand the keys of their backfield over to Powell. Right? Don't fret about the Week One performance. There are definitely better days ahead for Powell. Even though Forte outsnapped him, was in on sixty percent of their snaps, and Powell was only in on around fifty three percent. Powell out carried him seven to six and was out targeted six to five. So he saw more opportunity and it's definitely a good sign of things to come. Seeing as how that like snap split and that touch split took like 65% of the 2016 season just to get there. So it's definitely trending in the right direction and I see Powell taking over sooner rather than later. Another positive I noticed for Powell was the fact that um, he actually caught a ball and was tackled on the one yard line, really close to a touchdown. But Powell only had two targets last year, the entire year inside the opponent's 10 yard line. And he already had one in week one. So I, you know, those quick hitting passing targets are gonna be a lot more available this year, just the way how bad their offense is and how they're gonna need to get the ball out quickly. So hold on to Powell, don't fret about him. Last running back situation to talk about is Carolina. McCaffrey, Stewart, Stewart, McCaffrey. The box score does not line up with the eye test here in terms of usage and in terms of like what we're looking at going forward, right? Stewart out-touched McCaffrey 20 to 18, but McCaffrey out-snapped Stewart. He was in on 67% of Carolina snaps. Stewart was only in on 46% of their snaps. And a ton of his production, a ton of his touches came in garbage time and when, you know, game script and they were running out the clock. McCaffrey got a lot of work in the first half. He played a lot in the first half and it wasn't until the game was like clearly out of hand that Stewart got a ton of his touch. Stewart had seven of his 18 carries on the final drive, like their closeout drive by the Panthers. There were eight minutes left in the fourth quarter. They were up 23 to three, just closing out the clock. Stewart had seven of his 18 carries on that, on that drive. So you take that drive out and C-Mac easily out-touches Stewart. So what I would say too is a good sign is even in a blowout win where they, you know, they killed the, the 49ers, McCaffrey still caught five balls. So it's looking like no matter what the game script is, McCaffrey's still going to be well involved in the passing game and well involved in their game plan. You know what I mean? So McCaffrey, for me, the value is looking good. Uh, next week might be more the same that we saw this week as the Panthers are playing the Bills. They're home. They're seven and a half point favorites. So they should be, they're expected to be leading a lot. Don't fret if, you know, if week two comes and it's still a similar touch situation there. I want to hit on some must starts. And this is just going to be a couple running backs and a tight end. I'm not going to go into wide receivers right now because basically for wide receivers, the ones that I covered in the wide receiver cornerback matchups that have really favorable matchups, you can kind of put put them into this category here. Number one on the list, Ty Montgomery. Must start, clear bell cow in that Packers offense, handled over 85% of their snaps, would have been over 90%, maybe even higher, had he not left the game for a little while with like a really minor leg issue, uh, came back in, was fine. He gets Atlanta in week two. I know as a Falcons fan, I watch their games, they get killed by pass catching running backs. Forget rushing yards from Ty Mont, you know, even if he has 40, 50 rushing yards, He's probably going to go for like 50 or 60 along with five or six catches through the air. It's not just historical. Look at look at what Tariq Cohen did in his first NFL game ever to, to the Falcons in week one. Eight catches. I mean, the game has an over under 53 and a half, according to Vegas, the second highest total of the week behind just the uh, Patriots and the Saints. So there's supposed to be a lot of points scored here. Should be fast paced, should be a lot of yards, a lot of catches, a lot of all of that. So time on, fire him up, no question. Second on my list, we got a little twofer. It's Mike Gillisley and James White. It wasn't a good showing from New England in week one, but it did clarify that Gillisley is clearly the short yardage, the goal line, and the early down back. And it did clarify that James White is clearly the pass catching back, along with getting some work as a, as a running back. He had 10 carries in the first game too. So I'll gladly start both of these guys, and this goes back to the Vegas over-under. Their over-under is at 56. They're playing in the Dome in New Orleans. Patriots are pissed off. They're looking to bounce back from that loss to KC. 
you, this is just going to be a points points galore, right? So I'm okay starting both of these guys. They're the clear favorite in their role. You look at James White, like Julian Edelman's out. Danny Amendola didn't practice. Uh, this is I'm making this on Wednesday. Didn't practice on Wednesday, so it's looking like they're going to be missing Edelman and Amendola. That's even more upside for James White. I expect both of them to hit pay dirt in week two. So fire both of those guys up with confidence. Thirdly, a guy I just kind of touched on, Blau Powell. They're on the road. At Oakland, they are 14 point underdogs, two touchdown underdogs. This is where Powell will shine. I'm willing to bet he finishes with six to eight catches. He's gonna he's gonna have a really really nice PPR day for you guys. Standard, I'm not so you know I'm not so high on him, but I do think he catches a ton of balls. You know he out targeted and out touched Forte last week, so I expect a lot of the same. Even in a split, Powell is much more suited as as the as the favorite pass catching back. Last year, he ranked fourth in the NFL among running backs in both targets and receptions. So Powell, I feel like a lot of people don't really understand how good of a pass catching back Powell is. And on a team that's going to struggle a lot to score points and a lot to match their opponents, you know, they're going to trail a lot. Powell is in a very valuable situation. I went back on a, and last year I looked at games where, you know, because the spread is 14 points for this game. I looked at games where the Jets lost by 14 points or more, which was six games. And Powell averaged just under five catches in those six games. And two of those games were in the beginning of the season when Forte was dominating the touches so I would expect it even more there so I really like Powell this week uh, as a PPR play last on my must starts is Eric Ebron tight end out of Detroit throw it up Ema, let's get it he did barely anything in week one right he caught two of his three targets for like nine yards Saw a lot of Tyron Matthew against Arizona. He's slowly coming back from that offseason hamstring injury, right? So he's getting acclimated to the lineup more and more. Now, week two, he gets a really, really, really nice matchup against the Giants. They're always really bad against tight ends. They have slow linebackers that can't cover guys. Look at what Jason fucking Witten did to them in week one. Threw up a seven for 59 and a touchdown spot on them. I expect close to the same numbers for Ebron. So fire Ebron up if you're, you know, if you're deciding between one of the later round tight ends and you took him, he might even be on the wire for you guys. If you're weak at tight end, I would be totally happy playing Eric Ebron there. All right, I wanna move into some sell high candidates. If you follow me on Twitter, you already know probably where I'm, actually, if you've ever followed me, you probably know where I'm going with this already. Todd Gurley, this couldn't have worked out any more perfectly. I already hated him coming to the season. Had an incredible week one matchup against the Colts. Really good fantasy production from him, terrible efficiency in, in, as a real life player that's eventually going to translate into him just being a shitty fantasy player he had a, he literally the game script couldn't have been anywhere close to better the, the rams got up so big so early all they could do was pound the rock to Gurley. they went against andrew luck and vontae davis list colts it couldn't have been better for Gurley, right and he still sucked ass he had 40 rushing yards on 19 carries that's 2.1 yards per carry did score which saved fantasy owners standard fantasy owners he did look good, admittedly, catching the ball, right? He caught five of his six targets for 56 yards, and that was something that new head coach Sean McVay said was going to be more like prevalent in his game come 2017. What I want to say, Todd Gurley has eclipsed 90 rushing yards one time over his last 25 games. Todd Gurley went over 90 rushing yards one time over his last 25 games games. Todd Gur... I'm just kidding. That was back in 2015, two years ago. I don't think you understand how hard, with the amount of touches he gets, how bad you have to be. From the eye test, I watched, I went back and watched his carries. He didn't look good. He was not making guys miss. He was getting tackled by weak arm, car uh, arm tackles that a powerful running back that he's supposed to be would have broken off and gained another six, seven, eight yards. Gurley's finished in my book. He sooner rather than later, he is going to be not the workhorse there in LA. In the second half of that game, he gained one yard on eight carries. According to NFL Next Gen Stats, Gurley was the second most inefficient running back all of week one. He's literally an RB2 based purely off of volume, and he's never going to see a game script like he saw in week one this year. Now, I will say he gets nice matchups against Washington this week at San Fran at Dallas, but he is like the ultimate sell high fantasy guy following these next couple games because after those games, he has a brutal, brutal slate of run defenses, right? Seattle at Jacksonville, Arizona gets a bye at New York Giants, Houston at Minnesota. Not to mention his week 15, his first fantasy playoff matchup is at Seattle. There's nothing to look forward to when you when it comes to Gurley. So if you could sell him right now, 
do that. If you want to gamble and wait this week or next week and expect maybe one or two more big games and then sell, even better. I'm not even going to promise that he's going to have a big game against Washington, but you got to get Gurley out of your lineup. I'm telling you. This next one's not going to be a popular pick. I'm actually like kind of scared to say it because I don't want to, I feel like I might lose some people here with this. But I'm going to say Leonard Fournette. I wasn't super high on him going into the season for a few reasons. That offense, his foot issues, whatever. It's not often that you're told to trade a guy that touched the ball 29 times. And he looked good in week one. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to admit that. I get it. 26 carries, 100 rushing yards, a rushing touchdown. Caught all three of his targets for 24 yards. Like, he couldn't have had a better fantasy debut. Here's what I'll say. He will never get a game script like that again for the rest of the season that allowed the Jags to give him 29 touches without without a single worry. Blake Bortles completed 11 passes in that game. 11. And that was all they needed to stomp out the Texans. That shit ain't happening again. In my eyes, he's still a very much volume dependent, touchdown dependent fantasy back with limited scoring upside in this offense. He averaged 3.8 yards per carry in this game. He looked good, but it's still a bad offensive line. It's still a bad offense. And he played without TJ Yeldon. He caught three balls for 24 yards, which is a nice PPR bonus for you. But Yeldon is practicing in full for week two. So he's going to be back, which kind of limits his passing game upside. Now, don't get me wrong. I would love to have Leonard Fournette as my RB2 in fantasy. But at this moment, you're going to be able to trade him for RB1 value right? Like you could probably, honestly, you could probably trade him and maybe like go like Leonard Fournette and, and like a mid to late tier tight end for Gronk. Go Fournette and I don't know, like Rashard Matthews for Doug Baldwin or, or Amari Cooper or something like that. I would be happy with that. Like I said, he looked, he looked pretty good and it was a great week one, but I think most games you're going to see Fournette finish between like 70 and 90 total yards without a score. So again, I could be totally wrong here on Fournette. If you're comfortable keeping him, keep him. But if I'm selling him, now is the time to do it. Coming off this monster week one performance, he's going to he's gonna get you a lot of value. Now this section of the video is what we call relax. R-E-L-A-X. Aaron Rodgers said it best. Everyone calm down. One game, don't worry about these guys. Le'Veon Bell, just stop. Just stop. Just stop. I literally don't know what the fuck happened with Le'Veon Bell in week one, but just be happy he's on your team and not David Johnson. I'll leave it at that. Honestly, try offering the, the Le'Veon Bell owner in your league, Kareem Hunt, or, or or Leonard Fournette straight up and see what happens there. That's that's a strategy you could that you could use. Next up, Russell Wilson. I'll admit I'm a little more nervous following week one and just seeing how terrible their offensive line was. But I got faith in our dubs and I got faith in Pete Carroll to turn it around and make it work just like they have in the previous five, six seasons. Also credit Green Bay's defense. A lot of people came into this game, myself included, expecting the Seahawks to run all over this defense who was really poor in pass. Lest we forgot, Green Bay was killed with injuries on the defensive side of the ball in the beginning of the season last year. And that just wiped away any any production that they could get from that side of the ball. Now they're healthy. Now they're looking a lot, lot, lot better. Also, for some reason, Lambeau Field just has Russell Wilson's numbers. Like, look at these splits. In the last three years, and this is his, uh, he's only played at Lambeau three times, but they just happened in his career, but it just happened to be in the last three years. His splits playing at Lambeau versus anywhere else, kind of like jaw dropping. He averages a two to one interception to touchdown ratio, not the other way around. He's just really bad at Lambeau. So I'm gonna chalk this up to week one, get that offensive line together, better playing at Lambeau. So I expect a big bounce back from Russell Wilson against San Fran in week two. Next up, terrific Tom, Tom Brady, just grow up. All the elite tight ends, every one of them shit the bed. Gronk, Kelsey, Jimmy Graham, Tyler Eifert, I already said Jimmy Graham, I forget the other ones. Jordan Reed, all those guys were really bad. I wouldn't consider Delaney Walker, Zach Ertz elite tight ends, so I didn't name them. Oh, both of those guys way outperformed the elite tight ends. It's one game, move on. There is reason for concern with a few of these guys. I would say Jimmy Graham, the fact that their offensive line is so bad, he might have to stay in and block more than he usually would. Jordan Reed, obviously that toe injury, he looked healthy to me playing, but that could that's something that could wear on him throughout the season and he might slow down as the season goes on. Craig Olsen with McCaffrey there, maybe the shorter targets, but was dump offs to McCaffrey in that offense. So I, I would say like, I'm not moving any of these guys, but I would, if, if, if they put up like three dud weeks in a row, I'm definitely gonna be concerned about some of them. But for now, just, just, just 
take it easy. Last up, just a quick name, Alshon Jeffrey. He's not someone I targeted in drafts, really, and I'm definitely not worrying it. He's another rule three guy for me. Wait three weeks before you start panicking on guys you drafted. You know, he faced off with Josh Norman a lot of the time during this week, which left Wentz having to target, you know, other guys like Nelson Aguilar. He took a lot of shots deep to Torrey Smith. A ton of targets to Zach Ertz, who caught like eight or nine balls. So he's still got seven targets, which is not bad. If he's not going against an elite guy, you know, like Josh Norman, then I expect much better numbers. So again, wait a few weeks before you start panicking panicking on Alshon Jeffrey. He's still an elite talent on a team that throws the ball a ton. So we did sell high, we did relax, buy low. Buy low guys, I'm sure a lot of you guys watched my video of the trade targets, right? Week one through four, top trade targets. And thus far, it's played out almost perfectly to what I've said. We saw a really bad game from Dez. We saw a really weak game from Isaiah Crowell but he dominated the running back snaps. He had 76% of their of their snaps. He dominated the touches. He had 19 touches. And the offense, like I said in that video, will only improve and so will Crowell's numbers. So the 19 touches is definitely encouraging for Crowell. Their team wants to feed him and wants to be more of a running team. Now I look back last year, right? Crowell only had 19 touches four times last year in 2016. And in those four games, he averaged 127 total yards and he scored four times in four games. So if he keeps getting those touches, the numbers will come. But like I said, I actually want to show you guys. We're going we're going in depth here. This we're gonna do a little film breakdown with Nicholas. Fasten your seatbelts, we're going on the cover. So in that trade video, I explained how I think Crowell's gonna come on because one, he's gonna to continue to get touches, but most importantly, having Deshaun Kaiser as the quarterback, when you have a mobile quarterback that opens up a lot of lanes for you as a running back. And I went kind of in depth on it during that video, but I want to show you guys exactly what I mean. So we're going to hit the type. So this is a game, this is not Crowell and, and Kaiser because I don't expect that to come yet. This is actually the Texans game. Shit, wrong game, bear with me. Okay, so when you have a mobile quarterback, right? What this allows you to do is line the quarterback up with the running back here and it's the option formation, right? He can either hand the ball off to the running back or he could run it himself. And this works well if you have a running quarterback. You got Deshaun Watson and Lamar Miller here. What I'm going to do is keep an eye on the linebackers here, and I'll walk it through. I'm going to put this in slow-mo for you guys to see. It's going slow, right? The ball is snapped. He's going to fake the handoff, right? Or he's going to give the handoff, but these two guys on the edge both need to look out for Deshaun Watson. So that leaves the whole linebacker core going this way when Lamar Miller is running that way. We'll go look at that again. Just watch these two linebackers here and here, the edge and the middle. They both go towards Deshaun Watson which leaves only one guy to beat. All you have to do is make the first guy miss or have a blocker get to that second level and boom, you're easy five, six, seven yards a carry. If it's Tom Savage there, the linebackers are not crashing his way, right? That's two more guys in the box just diving in on Lamar Miller. I think I had another example here too I wanted to show you where we at though. So we have the same formation here, snaps it. Hands the ball off. He crashes that way. See that linebacker crash that way? So instead of having seven guys in the box, you almost have to have only six, right? So you're always getting less guys up front because someone has to keep an eye on the quarterback when you have a mobile quarterback. So that is, you know, like when you have that, it almost automatically adds an extra one to two yards on your yards per carry. And I went back and looked at Lamar Miller's numbers, right? When you look at the first half carries with Tom Savage, he got six carries in the first half, 15 yards, 2.5 yards per carry. He had 11 carries in the second half with Deshaun Watson at quarterback. He came out to like 48 or 50 yards or something like that. It was 4.5 yards per carry. So two yards per carry difference. What I'm saying is that like, Anytime you have a mobile quarterback, right, you run that option, it knocks down the amount of guys in the box that are going to have to defend you as a running back. So take that 2.5 yards per carry, put it into four and a half yards per carry. You don't even have to be that good of a running back in order, if they give you 19, 20 carries, you're going to hit 80 to 100 yards every game with that type of volume. And that was the point I was getting across with Crowell. I just wanted to show you what I meant by that. And that's historically why the numbers are always better when you have a mobile quarterback, because it just opens the linebackers up, because they have to get out of the way. And uh, lastly, I think, so we had Dez had a weak game, Crowell weak game, but a lot of good touches. Mariota. And Dez still has uh, other tough matchups, so I said to trade for him after week three. But Mariota expected a good game against Oakland. He had a nice fantasy day, but now he gets a really tough slate of matchups with Jackson at Jackson. Jacksonville, Seattle, at Houston. So Mariota, along with probably the other weapons on that Tennessee team, 
it, you can kind of expect a drop off in production. So don't expect much from them right now. But then after that week four game, there, there are people that I'm definitely targeting, especially Corey Davis after that initial game that he had. He looked really, 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 really good. Caught six for 69. Um, everyone on that team basically eight, right? They all had like seven, eight, nine targets. So they're going to be spreading the love around there, and they're going to be you know switching on and off with big games. But when they have good matchups, they're a team that you can kind of load up on. Let's get to the Ken cut list. I get a lot of questions about, you know, should I cut this guy? Can I cut this guy? Should I roster him? So Darren McFadden, get him off your team. Zeke is playing the whole year. Eddie Lacy, do we need to go over this again? Kenny Britt, this one kind of hurts a little bit because I had him as a Cleveland wide receiver to own here. I mean, you're not using more than like a 10th round pick on either of them, so it's not really a big deal, but looks like Coleman is the guy to own here going forward. Had a nice five, uh, five for 53 and a tutty in week one. At least for now, he's the guy to own. I mean, I'm not necessarily excited about him, but this this Cleveland offense definitely can't maintain two fantasy wide receivers. Robert Turbin, I don't know if he drafted him as like a, I don't know, a late round flyer or a guy behind Gore or whatever, but the team is just awful without Andrew Luck. Marlon Mack and Frank Gore dominated the touches in this backfield. Turbin barely played, barely got any touches. So I don't know, just get Robert Turbin off your team. Carson Palmer, he looks god awful. They don't have David Johnson anymore at least for a long time. So Palmer, you know what? I'm actually thinking about streaming Palmer against Indianapolis in uh, in week two in one of my deeper leagues. I feel like I'm going to regret that. But I also feel like it's, that's the way the NFL works, right? He's going to be like, everyone's going to be like, oh, Palmer sucks. And now week two, he's just going to come back with like a 350 yard, two touchdown performance. And people be like, oh, he could stream it again. It's like, it's ridiculous how it works on a week to week basis. But uh, yeah, I mean, you, I, I wouldn't hate streaming him against Indy in week two, but after that, you cannot use him again without David Johnson. Uh, Zay Jones, anything outside of PPR, you have to get him off your team. Only got four targets. Uh, Charles Clay ate up a lot of those short yardage targets. Jordan Matthews had a big play. He had like 60 yards receiving. One of them was like a 45 yard catch. But yeah, Zay Jones, I just, I don't know. He, he had eight targets in that in that last preseason game, so it looked to be like he was the guy, but they also didn't have Jordan Matthews at the time. Charles Clay, basically eight last game, so he got a lot of those short yardage targets. So Zay Jones, outside of full PPR, you could drop him. Latavius Murray, I don't know why people drafted him in the first place, but he played in 5% in of their snaps. Dalvin Cook absolutely dominated, doesn't matter. Either Oakland backup running back, Jalen Richard, DeAndre Washington, outside of like 10 team leagues, absolutely don't own them. 12 team leagues, I mean, you could own probably DeAndre Washington as like maybe like a handcuff or a late round flyer guy, but neither of them really got significant work in that first game and they, they split work pretty evenly. So you don't even have like a clear RB2 right now. So you can drop any of those fudges if you, if you want guys on the wire. I would drop any of those guys for Alan Hearns, any of the running backs over in my waiver wire sheet. Now with the streaming defenses of the week. Number one, easiest one here, Baltimore versus Cleveland. They're only owned in 50% of Yahoo leagues. They just dominated the Bengals 20 to nothing. The Ravens get to play the Browns in week two. So coming off like a real strong defensive performance, they're licking their chops. They get to go against a rookie quarterback, Deshaun Kaiser. The game opened up at seven and a half or seven point favorites for the Ravens. They're now up to eight and a half and the over-under is only 38 and a half. So they're expecting a real low scoring game and for Baltimore to dominate. So Vegas is always a good measure of defenses when you're trying to decide sit start go with a low over under and go with a heavy favorite and that's exactly what baltimore is right they're coming off 25 fantasy points they had last week five sacks they had the shutout obviously four interceptions fumble recovery and then you look at the browns who just let up seven sacks to pittsburgh an interception a fumble all that just says baltimore dominates and is a fantastic fantasy option this week if they're still available on their wire. Next up, we got Jacksonville versus Tennessee. Jacksonville's only owned in 37% of Yahoo leagues. I'll be honest, I'm a little, well, still a little skeptical about the Jaguars as an elite defense, especially for fantasy purposes. But I mean, it's hard to argue against 10 sacks, interception, three fumble recoveries, touchdown, only allowing seven points. So why am I skeptical? I mean, well, this was against the Texans. Terrible offensive line. Tom Savage was the quarterback in the first half. A rookie, Deshaun Watson, who's never played in the NFL before. For the second half, and there was, you know, it, it, there's definitely still things to be skeptical about. And Jacksonville does have a tougher matchup in, in Tennessee for week two. You know, they have a much better offensive line. It's one of the elite offensive lines in the NFL. So it should be a really interesting matchup. But this one's more of a, a speculative play, right? Just for the fact that Jacksonville looked so good last week. And lastly, we have the Bengals, Thursday night football. Hopefully this, I think this will get out to you before tonight's game. They're only 24% of Yahoo leagues. Now I'm no way advocating the Bengals as a good defense, 
but you could find much worse in week two, right? They play in like 36 hours and they didn't even know their starting quarterback until like just recently. So, you know, since he's a five point favorite and they have the lowest over on over under total of the week at 38. So they don't expect Houston to score like a lot of points whatsoever. And we saw how many times Houston got sacked. They let up 10 sacks at Jacksonville. So you can definitely find a worse streaming defense than, uh, than Cincy. Whew. We're almost done here, guys. I promise. Locks of the century. Hashtag LOTC. These are for y'all gambling, folks. I give three gambling bets that I think will pay off each week. Week one, we take a look back. I had the Jets plus 10 against Buffalo as a dub. I had Atlanta and Chicago under 48 and a half. Dub. And I also had Tennessee covering two and a half. So we take an L there. We're two and one on the season. Week two, my locks of the century. We have New York Jets at Oakland. Over 43 and a half. I love that Oakland defense to throw up a 35 spot. LA Chargers, minus four versus Miami. I think the Chargers are going to pick apart that defense. I don't think they're very good on the rush front. I don't think they're very good on the secondary. So I like Chargers to put up a lot of points here, and I like them to cover four. And my third lock of the century, we got Minnesota at Pittsburgh. We're going over 45 and a half. I don't really know why. Pittsburgh and Minnesota both look like good defenses in week one, but Minnesota looked like a great offense and Pittsburgh is always a great offense when they're playing at home. So I, you know, I just like them going over 45 and a half here. That's it. And I know a lot of you guys wanted me to go over league recaps. My E-Town get down draft. So I'm in four money leagues, four cash leagues, four season long leagues. I don't really play DFS. I should put in a section for next week. I'll do some DFS plays for you guys. I got E-Town get down, which you guys probably watched a live draft of. A league with my college buddies, a subscriber league, and then the fantasy jocks office league. So I went two and two on the week. I won my college league. I won the fantasy jocks league. I lost the subscriber league. Yo, Lee, fuck you. I'm just kidding, dog. So I lost in the subscriber league by 0.3 points. I had Andy Dalton starting at my quarterback who scored me negative three points and I kept <laughs> I kept Odell Beckham Jr. in on my flex spot by accident because you know why because well, well this is actually why if, if I'm being completely honest with you I went out Saturday night right I got home at like four I was extremely hungover when I woke up then I went on YouTube live like as soon as I woke up it was me my friend Brandon and my friend Steve we we're on live basically for like two hours and I like just didn't set my lineups really. Like I did, I was looking at them, but I didn't look at it in depth enough to realize that OBJ was in my last flex spot on my fourth league. I kept OBJ in, I lost by point three because I left OBJ in and I had Andy Dalton at quarterback. Whatever, two and two, not the worst. I'm upset that I lost in my E-Town get down league. This is why, I mean, maybe it's not why I lost, but here's, well, I mean, here is definitely why. First of all, OBJ didn't play in my first round pick. Two, I had Dez going up against that shitty ass matchup. And I had Danny Woodhead and Allen Robinson both in my starting lineup. Both go out within like five minutes of the first game. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, here we go. So I had everything working against me in that. So I'm looking for a big bounce back week two. We're going to get that dub. We're going to get that dub. Anyways, yeah, that's this is a long video, guys. I'm sorry. I'm, thank you if you stayed for the whole thing. These, these one-week recaps, I mean, since I'm only putting out one video a week they're probably going to be longer and i hope you guys like this style if you do like comment down below and let me know if there's anything else i should add to this if you guys like the style if you like the length like would you rather me try to condense it into like 20 minute videos or is the 60 minute video okay i know a lot of people probably listen to podcasts during this year what you could do is just open up the youtube app on your phone you don't have to watch me you could just play it through your earphones if that's what you do normally with podcasts but yeah just let me know down below and as always give it that thumbs up if you enjoyed the video and because i worked hard on it so i'd appreciate the thumbs up very much one or two more things to cover i would say i'm doing a podcast every week with fantasy football advice they're working on getting it onto itunes but for now they're just going to be uploading it to YouTube on their channel. So every Thursday night, I think we're going to film it or, or record it. And then it's going to be up on their channel either Friday or Saturday. So you guys can go check out their channel. So it's basically their version of this, but I'm going to be on it with them. Lastly, the dad hat giveaway. What you need to do in order to be entered into this. Here's what I want you to do. One, of course, you have to be subscribed to me on YouTube. Two, you got to go follow me on Twitter. Three, go give this video a thumbs up. And here's what I want. Give me your best story, your best fantasy story from week one. I'm talking about like how I lost by point three because I accidentally left OBJ in and Andy Dalton scored me negative three points. Give me your best story. It could be a win. It could be a loss. It could be like the last 
play of Monday Night Football where Sam Bradford kneeled, lost me the game or something like that, I want to hear your best story from week one. Comment it down below and I'll choose two winners, one for the blue hat, one for the pink hat. I'll contact you. I'll comment down below on the video, but I'll also contact you via email. So do that. Comment down below. Follow me on Twitter, all that good shit. And that's it for week one. Good luck in week two, fellas.